Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay, now we're back. All right. Uh, this is Bat Stevens in uh, Align UAE, and this is Learning Together, uh, a weekly show we have at about this time every Sunday. We try to have it about this time every Sunday. And we're, I'm just chuffed, just really pleased today to have a good friend, Jeff Magoto. He's uh, coming to us from the University of Oregon. Uh, the reason he's here, uh, or the reason we, I asked him, I'm, you know, I, a lot of people, a lot of these events just kind of happen, but uh, I especially invited Jeff because uh, actually it was me, I put a uh, request to the webheads list asking if anybody could do, uh, could suggest software that would do sort of what Jeff's got pictured in the, uh, in the slide that you see on the screen right now. As I'm teaching pilots and these guys need to talk to control pow- towers and I was looking for some software uh, that would provide a solution, and Anvil just kept popping up. In the, you know, the people gave that really high marks for uh, being a really great uh, software tool. And well, it's more than just it's more than that. But Jeff's going to tell us about it. Uh, Jeff, are you the developer of Anvil? Um, co-developer. <laughs> Actually, all the coding was done by a former graduate student who decided that uh, he didn't want to have a career in English language teaching. He'd rather be a full-time programmer. Oh, how fortunate. Uh, what's that person's name? <laughs> Norman Kerr. He's not, for a, he's not available for hire. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah, well, I mean, anyway, it's, it's great to have such a partner. I mean, you're a, a pedagogical brain plus a programmer. And, and the result is stunning. So well, go on and tell us more about it. All right. Well, thanks for ha- inviting me, Vance. And uh, um, you know, maybe just to uh, reiterate what Vance just said, I don't think any long-term technology project uh, these days can can survive without you know either advanced uh, ESL teacher who also happens to be a coder or uh, ideally. Um, at least two, two of those heads. So the partnership I've had over the years um, actually started with uh, another friend of ours, Vance, uh, Jim Duber, back in 2003. You may remember he posted a site called uh, uh, You Say Tomato, I Say Tomato. I remember and, quite uh, well. Yeah. And, and I was <laughs> good, I'd actually good. kind of surprised to see that Duber.com was uh, uh, one of your collaborators as well. Or Well, you, you can tell us the association as you go. Um, but I, I start with this first slide just to sort of situate myself. Uh, that was not me in number 17, 18, uh, booth number 17 or 18, but I was an undergraduate in the mid-70s and I started teaching English in the late 70s. And um, um, when I started teaching English in the hills of Morocco, uh, there were no language labs, there was no technology except the days in which I was allowed to bring my boombox into the classroom. But um, for any of us who are of a certain age and um, encountered language learning and language teaching uh, primarily through ALM or very behavioralist driven uh, methodologies, this is certainly one association people have with the traditional language center, which um, if you've never seen or experienced it, Suffice it to say, um, it was technologically as complex as probably Vance's pilot simulators are, and uh, it was also probably pedagogically ineffective to the point that um, by the mid to late 80s, they had all but disappeared, uh, or excuse me, were disappearing. Uh, but one part of uh, that uh, experience, you know, the chance for a learner to direct uh, his or her own learning stuck with me. And uh, so the metaphor of being able to, you know, be in charge of your own learning and have a chance to uh, say something, albeit into a glass panel, as you see here, and hear it back and uh, ideally eventually get some feedback on what you, you said 
you know, has been kind of an abiding notion for me. And uh, if um, um, if that's totally foreign to your experience, I apologize. But I will quickly fast forward here and get out of the 70s and into the 2014s. Um, let me find my... Oh, actually, I'm only going to jump three years forward because uh, I'm still stuck in Morocco uh, in the late 70s. But uh, you know, something that was new to me as a teacher there that was quite popular at the time was uh, the idea of pen pals. Uh, I had never done them as a language student, but um, my fellow teacher in the village that we were in was really into the idea and he was able to secure a relationship with a school in the United States so our students in Morocco would write in French and the students in the United States would write to write back in English and those wonderful uh, pieces of early uh, asynchronous learning, the areogram, uh, were our primary conduit. I guess what I'm trying to do is give you a sense that uh, None of the ideas, I think, what, in what I'm going to say today are particularly new. The, what, what, what makes them new, obviously, is the technology that allows something that used to happen. Uh, areograms used to take about three weeks back and forth from Morocco. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now, of course, I can make my video recording and it can be seen instantly in Morocco. Um, so let me jump forward to <laughs> 2009, which is basically when Anvil got going. And what I wanted to do is sort of walk you through um, what we call Anvil 1, and which is the Anvil that people like Robert have used for quite a while. Um, I don't remember when you started using it, Robert. Probably three or four years ago, right? Um, and the most popular tool, which was basically um, a reworking of uh, that um, you say tomato, I say tomato tool I mentioned at the outset of the, um, that was um, an idea of Jim Duber, a friend, and uh, I just thought it was such a compelling idea. And the, the, the compelling idea here is the, the, let me see if I can use my pointer was this idea of taking what had become popular by 2009, the, obviously the text-based discussion board, and make it a multimedia um, version. So we enlisted Jim's support to build what we called Anvil 1. And um, the primary tool that was of interest to most teachers was basically a, a voice and then eventually a video um, voice board. And um, it, pretty much is what you see here. A student logs in, um, and she has the ability to write something. She has the ability to either record an audio or record a video. And what ensues or what develops is a conversation. And maybe uh, if I can jump back to that initial slide, one of the things, there were many things missing in that model of early language centers, but one of the big things that was missing was that most of the lessons that people were doing were content bereft. They were primarily substitution drills. They were primarily ways of, uh, you know, doing pattern practice. And one of the things that was so exciting about having a web-based version of a voice board was that the content could actually be built around some lesson material. So not only was the learner being directed to talk about something, but the learner had something to explore or play with. And, and so this was the sort of model of the early voice boards. Um, we built this with the help of a, uh, a grant we got from a National Foreign Language Resource Center. And uh, we made it available to the world. Um, and it caught on pretty fast. Um, within the first year, we had about 500 teachers using it. And now we have about 2,500 teachers using it um, and about 50,000 students. And basically, for many teachers, this is all they were looking for, a place to have their students log in and record something. Um, yes, I should. <laughs> thank you. 
for Rhyme Advance, a, a, a way to do it for free because nothing that I'm showing here was, you know, unheard of in the, in the commercial space. Um, and all of the former big players in the audio, the analog versions, the Sonys, the Tanbergs, um, the Pioneers, they, they were, you know, trying to come up with digital solutions too. So our goal was to do it um, as cheaply as possible, but as, um, you know, meaningfully as possible. And the way you do something cheaply in the software world, of course, is you use a framework that is open source. And so um, the tool that we built this around is called Drupal. It's a, one of many web frameworks. And, um, and then nested within that framework is Jim's work with the voice board that you see here. Let me show you some more aspects of Anvil 1 and uh, give you a sense of how our thinking uh, was able to evolve over the years. And the nice thing about this project was we tried to approach it as a research project and we didn't really know what tools teachers were interested in, um, except this one, which um, by 2009 had become abundantly uh, clear that people wanted to have a way for students to uh, record and for them to listen to it and ideally to give feedback. Uh, um, so let me move on a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to remember, Vance, how to get the page or just be a pull down. But um, this slide, I'm sure, is really invisible or <laughs> not visible, and I apologize did, for that. Did I just? But I just wanted to. Sorry, Jeff, did I just change the slide? <laughs> Ideas for media-rich lessons? Did that change? Uh, did it change for you? No. Are you now we're um, back to oral language teaching, 2009. Okay. And now let me change. Now we're ideas for media-rich lessons. I was wondering. Good. It, it, so it, what I'm going to yeah, do you can ask me if you want, if you need help advancing, I'll just. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, uh, what I thought I'd do is just walk you through some of the most common uh, types of lessons that teachers have developed with the tools that are built into Anvil 1 and uh, um, sort of show how that shaped what influenced um, what has become Anvil 2, which we've been playing with for or building for the last couple of years, and how that process is um, to get us completely up to the future um, to what we're calling Anvil LTI. Um, but first, the most important thing is what do teachers actually do with a tool like Anvil? So that's what I wanted to show you here. <coughs> and um, I guess this first slide is not really um, about what teachers wanted to do with the tool, but when we did a lot of focus groups with students, what they wanted, what they didn't want to go away from the old language lab model was a way to just record and hear the voice. So the first tool that we added to Anvil was this practice recorder you see the arrow pointing to uh, down here. And so no matter what the stimulus was, whether teach students were hearing an audio file or they were given a poem or in this case some words from a song, a Portuguese song, um, they were just asked to pronounce those words. And so this, like all of the sort of communication tools in Anvil, is just something that the teacher plops into a, into a lesson. And um, so I hope that's straightforward. Um, Robert says the videos, okay, good, okay, go forward. Um, here in a little bit more focused way is that what that voice board looks like. And again, you see it's the only thing on a page. So our sort of you know, development model, the way we thought about um, communication tools for teachers, it is that um, 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 it should be, um, you know, a building block approach. And, you know, pages shouldn't get too complex, but it should be easy for a teacher to add some sort of interaction type on a page um, and it would just work. And so that's, again, why I think the voice board, what you see here, has become the most popular tool because it kind of just works. And um, it doesn't require too much 
prior <laughs> work on the part of the teacher. She all she has to do is come up with a topic, and that could be a web page, that could be, you know, her own sort of storytelling narrative, um, or it can be something as simple as, you know, here's a list of words to repeat, or here's a song I'd like you to sing, or here's a poem I'd like you to recite. Um, probably about a year and a half into the uh, development of this, it became quickly clear that, especially coming from, I guess I should say that we envisioned this a tool as a tool for all teachers, not teachers just teaching in a you know distance education or online learning, and not just teachers you know doing you know sort of lots of hybrid learning, but actually classroom teachers who wanted a way to push some of the content of you know what could be reasonably be pushed out of the class, um, done away from the class. Um, and you know, I guess what people nowadays would call flipped learning, essentially letting students do what they could do for themselves outside of class, and then to bring that work into a meaningful way back into the classroom. So what you see at the top is just an audio recorder that we let teachers insert anywhere in any lesson. We call it our TCAS tool. And basically, it differs from what you see here, which is sort of a common space for everybody, whereas this one is, and it's both audio and video, and it lets a teacher you know, do commentary, focus the lesson, basically drop the sound file or a video file anywhere throughout the lesson. And there you can see the video version. Um, a lesson that's a little bit more elaborated. There's a task up here. Um, there's an explanation of it here. And, you know, actually this was two tasks over a couple of weeks. So the original clarification is uh, was, was with audio and then subsequently with video. And we could have a long conversation about when to use which and why and so on. But, you know, obviously a lot of it depends on who your learners are, what kind of bandwidth they have, and how much that, you know, incredible power of video is, is necessary. Um, because with that power of the communication tool uh, also comes, um, you know, corresponding greater technology demands. Um, Here's something that's sort of a hybrid of what you've seen so far. So um, this should look familiar to anybody who does a lot with discussion tools. Um, what we tried to do here was, um, this is what we call our forum tool. And again, it's another kind of discussion board, but you know, multimedia based. And so we wanted to um, give students who are using many different kind of tools, in this case, Animoto, which is a easy way to turn you know, photos into a slideshow or movie. Um, so this, this space basically lets students um, either place you know, content coming from elsewhere, or they can also use that TCAS tool that I just showed for teachers um, as a way to make um, a different kind of uh, discussion board, um, one that's based on audio and video. So I hope that it's, while we don't um, we don't subordinate the role of text. Um, clearly, the driving force behind Anvil is to you know, do what text-based discussion boards, to do for speech what text-based discussion boards um, had been doing for quite some time. And again, th throughout all of this, we're using Flash, to, um, which is um, a long time way of getting multimedia content into web, uh, into web pages. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But just to give you a sense of what this is, so you can see that certain lessons are becoming more involved. So this one actually has quite a few parts to it. The lesson we're looking at right now is the one that's called the Animoto Gallery from Sandra. But there's also a lesson sequence called the Morning Show and Teaching the Technology. And, um, you know, so. As the tool got more complexity, teachers wanted to do more things with it, and the pages started to get a little bit more hectic looking. Um, again, just another way that we're trying to um, um, 
give teachers and students a, um, a different kind of interaction type. So here you have a YouTube video. Um, Anvil makes it really easy to plop any kind of Web 2.0 content right into a lesson. You have a task over here, and you have a way for teacher, excuse me, for students to talk back and collect it. And whereas most of our other tools are very public, this response tool is um, private. So this is the only tool in Anvil 1 where um, what the students do isn't seen by others. And we can talk about that in a, in a second, um, too. Um, again, we're using that TCAS tool that I've been alluding to. Um, it, it's our free form or our, our more uh, independently way of placing audio and video throughout a set of web pages. Um, I should say that everything a student records in Anvil goes into their own personal library. They, they have control over that library. Um, um, and so the, you know, the, the, the notion, of, the long-held notion of you know, students being able to um, have their web assets or their portfolio of, of, of work available to them is, um, you know, was also part of our thinking. Um, So now I'm going to, um, maybe I'll stop there and take a look at the text board and uh, um, just see if I can answer any questions before I move on to Anvil 2. Um, so I see a little bit of talk about um, Wimba. Vance, you want to summarize what, what, what's going on there? Yeah, I was hoping Melanie might uh, come in and ask. But in any event, yeah, something you said <coughs> talking about that the last on the last slide you were on got me thinking that you could emulate the Wimba threaded chat tool in Anvil fairly easily, I suppose. Has anybody done that, by the way? So I think are, are you talking about the forum here? Do you, yeah, do you remember the the Wimba came up with this really cool thing that used to market. And I, Melody said that it might be, uh, um, it might be have, have been bought by Blackboard. I can't, I can't remember. I think it did get bought by somebody. It might have been yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear we you. Can hear you. Uh, oh, yeah. I've never done this before. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought Wimble was something that Blackboard was an add-on for Blackboard. I keep asking my people about it at my college, but they don't seem to respond because I've been desperate to have something that I could hook into Blackboard so it could be private. And uh, I keep hearing Wimba, but nobody talks about it. You're the first one, Vance, I've seen talk about Wimba. And I'm pretty sure it was part of Blackboard at some point. It was indeed. Um, yeah. And I think they basically yeah. killed it. <laughs> yeah, but it was really nice. Uh, but basically, it was like a, any kind of other forum, except instead of sending text, you would send voice. And yeah. you, you could manipulate the thread and you know, by dragging sound files around and putting them in the right place. And um, you know, basically, people would just talk to each other, and you could play the you could play a thread of uh, voices and responses, and it was a really nice idea. And it looks like it could be emulated here in Anvil. And I'm trying to get. I was just wondering, if, Jeff, is that true? Um, yeah, maybe not good. as elegantly as I remember Wimba doing it, but uh, so this forum. So teachers use the forum both for you know whole class work and group work, and um, um, so this photo that we're looking at here of an Animoto object placed there could just as easily be the TCAS tool for Manvil. And, and that's, you know, it, you know, so I say something, you comment on it, and that's exactly the idea behind it. Um, I would say our discussion board is a little, um, well, I, what I remember the Wimba tool is that it was did it very elegantly, and uh, I don't know that I would say this is elegant, but um, in terms of having students talk to each other back and forth, that's exactly the idea. So oh yeah, I mean that's pretty it. elegant when there's just nothing else around at all at this point. You know, it's safe. And <laughs> yeah. Do oh, my gosh, I'm just so pleased to find something. Oh, finally. Oh, good. Thanks. Good. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's really interesting, how, especially the way you started, Jeff. You know, uh, taking the language lab, 
which is what I was looking for, you know, something that would basically do what a language lab used to do. I mean, you sit people down in a physical space and, and you have them mm -hmm. do what you're trying to get them to do online. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so you're going back to, like you said, the functionality really uh, is has always been there. You know, you're just trying to find some way that where you can implement what teachers are just trying to do. This is a great illustration of that. Yeah, nobody else is doing this. I mean, you, you can you can use all the different recording tools that are out there on the web, but they're not secure and they're not particularly private. Or the students have to send it to you by email, and I can't. I just can't have all those emails coming in with recordings on them, and to have one spot where they can go. Phew, what a relief! Melody, uh, while well, we have you on, yeah, could, could we just ask Melody uh, who you are, wh where you teach, what are you oh, teaching? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, I teach in Connecticut at a community college, Nakatuck Valley Community College in Waterbury, Connecticut. And we we have a lot of tech, but we don't have the largest DSL program going, and we don't have a language lab. Um, we've got lots of computer rooms. Uh, I've since bought uh, microphones with, I mean, headphones with microphones and trying to get students to use them. But basically, we've got an academic ESL program at six levels. Um, we focus mostly on reading and writing, but I'm really trying to bring in more listening and speaking because I think we've been, uh, we've neglected that, unfortunately, for our students. And that's really what we do. We get them ready for um, college work. We get foreign language credit for them for the classes. Let's see, we've got students all over, from all over, but really mostly Spanish speaking, uh, Central and South America. Uh, let's see. I guess that's about it. I've been there since '96. I am so interested in technology, and I'm apparently the only one <laughs> there who really is pushing for this. So that's it. Anything else? Well, I guess over back to Jeff. But you know, we we try to be conversational in these sessions. So if anybody yeah. has anything they want to say, I just thought uh, that there was something I had left out that might be helpful. No? Yeah, I just added a fourth mic. So, uh, okay. however, when you're not speaking, just click your mic off, and then other people can. That, that makes it available oh. for others. Thank you. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's um, one thing that Melanie said. That you know, how do you <laughs> how do you pay for projects like this? Well, one way is you get your you convince your university administrators <laughs> that um, that um, they can um, either pay us to build it, or they can pay someone else to build it. And if I can just, you know, take my my one rant about it's not about Wimba, it's <laughs> it's about anything that's uh, proprietary in this space. And so, um, having been in the language teaching business for almost 40 years, um, you know, when I took the job that I took here in Oregon. Uh, you know, the first thing they showed me was their brand new language lab, which didn't look that different from the one that I showed you at the outset uh, from 1975. And uh, um, you know, this was 1992. And I was saying, that, you know, where are the computers? And uh, they said, well, we have a few. So they spent all their money on a you know language lab that was basically, you know, within five or six years, equipment was breaking and so on. And and but the you know the takeaway from that for me was if if I can avoid it I'm going to stay away from a proprietary solution. So I want to say first and foremost that you know some of the tools that Melanie was alluding to you know Vocaroo or Boxapop or you know some of the others you know I think they have a a great place and and you know and you know even prior to those the audacities of the world and which still allow us to you know create great MP3 files. I mean. I think you know, from a language center director's perspective, I want something that's going to be as flexible as possible, and not make me rely on one vendor. And that's you know, that was one of the lessons I think every language center director learned the hard way. Um, you know, you had a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment that was you know not working. The headsets, by the way, still <laughs> still work though, so we still use those. And I also agree with Melanie that today's student is much more uh, likely to be wearing earbuds like I am right now than a headset and um, you know fortunately Anvil works with the microphones that most uh, most of the students have for their phones if they still can find their their earbuds then that came with their phones but that's probably also a good time to uh, um, 
um, you know, move on to where we are now. And I'm going to skip up here a little bit to Anvil 2, which we started development on in 2012 and uh, ran some pilot courses with last year. And, you know, hopefully it looks a bit different from what you had seen previously. So, you know, five years on or four years on into a project, you uh, learn a lot of things. And, you know, maybe the number one thing was is that while people came to Anvil because of the communication tools, what made them stay with Anvil was the lesson tools or the, the, the ability to, to create web content, um, meaningful language learning content um, in a fast and hopefully uh, attractive, meaningful way. And so when we went to go from one to two, we put a lot of time into trying to really simplify um, um, you know, the, the things that, you know, course management systems, learning management systems, you know, do well that we hadn't done very well in Anvil 1, which is, you know, make your lessons display in a, you know, attractive, obvious way. Uh, put content front and center and, uh, and, and make page layout a whole lot easier. So, you know, here's my lessons that, are, that go with this particular course. You know, the, the classic welcome, you know, should be accompanied not by a tiny little graphic, you know, tucked onto the side, but should be front and center. And I'll come back to the way we handle media. Um, and likewise, you know, web links and so on should just be, you know, up here. You put an email address on a page, it should just show up as any, a clickable link. And so we, you know, put as much attention into the lesson planning layout process as we did into um, improving our speech tools. And I will try and you know, develop that a little bit more as I go forward. Um, another sort of fuller page. So if you're um, wondering where this one comes from, I've given you uh, a couple of links, or and maybe I will repeat them at the end. But um, if you go to anvil.uoregon.edu, that will take you to Anvil 1. If you go to anvil.uoregon.edu slash Anvil 7, it will take you to this one. And I apologize for those URLs, which are, are unfortunately too similar, but we're in a transition period. And uh, well, it is what it is. But both Anvils are available for teachers. Both are free. Um, if you're just starting off with um, you know, this kind of thing, um, I would strongly encourage you to stick with Anvil 1. Um, um, it's, um, Anvil 2 is actually Anvil beta uh, indicated right there. And so uh, with all beta software, it changes frequently. And um, um, you know, it's not as bulletproof as Anvil 1. But the big change with Anvil 2 was to move so a lot of work has been done in the area of media in the web. And if you've heard of HTML5, you know, sort of the successor to the current um, HTML we have, um, you'll know that uh, one of the big aspects of it is this ability to be able to play audio and video and to record audio and hopefully soon to record video um, without using tools such as Flash. And what that means, you know, in a very simple way or a simplistic way for me, and I'm just going to page through these. These aren't doing anything more than what you've seen. And get to one where hopefully, oh, let me go back one, um, is to make audio and video available in any web page, any, you know, anytime, anywhere without doing what we currently do, which is pay quite a bit of money to run a Flash server, which handles all of our multimedia. You know, you'll still need servers. You'll still need, you know, thing, you'll still need the IT people. Um, but in terms of being able to develop rich interactive media lessons, um, this, this freedom from Flash is, is a really profound development. And we're just, you know, beginning to touch the, the um, you know, the, the possibilities of it. 
but you know here's you know something from a course that I'm actually the facilitator of, which is uh, called a self-study language course. And basically, if we get three students or more who are interested in the language, we try to put together a program for them, and it's um, basically two hours of meeting with a tutor in a small group, three or four or fewer, um, and then you know a quite a bit of flipped learning or independent learning or self-study, whatever you want to call it, and a chance to report back. And what you see here is the, the report back aspect, which you know many people you know have used Anvil and other tools for over the years. And what I just wanted to highlight here is that um, the voice board that I had shown previously, you know, now looks <laughs> more like an empty space. <laughs> you know, with the names of the people who are in the class, and a chance for them to talk and write back. And what I'm, you know, pointing out here is that instead of like one kind of uh, media, um, sort of one tool or one module to, to do one kind of media, now we can have this more open space where text and whether it's a, an a, attachment, as you can see here, which happens to be a YouTube video, or whether it's something written. Um, so you know, the, the kinds of media that we can handle are now as, are as rich as our ability to leverage web tools. And so that's kind of a, a cool space. And um, so this particular tool, this portfolio tool, this is a dialogue only between the teacher and the student. And so this one is not public. Um, but there's still the voice board side, which which is public. So, you know, one, another thing that teachers asked about was, you know, for a variety of reasons, from confidentiality to if you're working on something very personal and idiosyncratic, like pronunciation, for example, you um, you uh, want to be able to to do that in a, in a more classical portfolio or private space. So, this is what the students submitted, and this is how the teacher responded. And I'm not sure why the Arabic starts over here on this particular one, but do trust that it works in most of the world's languages. And that's, again, thanks to the web, not thanks to uh, anything that we did in particular. A more traditional kind of, you know, again, comment, response. And I'm focusing on these because um, something that's been part and parcel of Anvil from the very beginning. I'm going to jump back up to my <laughs> slide that I showed here. Is this ability not just to have, you know, students? You know, in the big in the old days, the salespeople for language labs would say, and you know what? They can talk. You can talk to the person sitting behind you. Well, you know, teachers you know, were quite aware that. Uh, their students not only can talk to students sitting behind them, but they want to be able to talk to people who use the language elsewhere. And so I think you know what we're seeing here is uh, you know finally this ability that you know this dialogue between a teacher and a student can just as easily be a dialogue between two students you know anywhere in the world. So all of the work that's been done on telecollaborations on um, exchanges, rich media exchanges. Um, I, I would say that you know, if someone asked me what I'm proudest of most, uh, uh, pr what makes me proud about Anvil is, is um, that you know I've seen many teachers use it for as a telecollaboration tool, and we can talk some more about that in a second. But uh, my five-year uh, uh, you know, watching you know French classes here at the University of Oregon, for example, for more than five years, you know, every second year French student gets the opportunity to have a partner in France, and and you know, and, you know, nowadays that partnership, you know, could be on Facebook, book it could be, um, you know, Skype, um, but the teachers involved, and I guess I should say this too, is making telecollaborations work is. You know, a sociological phenomenon more than it is a technological one. Um, you know, two teachers have to you know, do a fair amount of work to build the interest in their students and make sure that you know students have the support they need to make it happen. But, but um, um, 
you know, I can't tell you how many you know French students have said that it's you know this ability to have a partner and you know to stick together for they usually do it minimally for one semester and typically for more than that and the friendships persist and, and all that good stuff that goes around that work but my point here is that we want to make that dialogue process really easy and we want to make it media rich as well as text rich um, I'm not sure what I I've just again this is one of the classes in that course that you just saw um, um, my point here is that uh, um, no matter what kind of text type or media type you throw at Anvil 2, it handles it pretty well. So here's a PDF, just a simple grammar explanation. Um, like most modern uh, blogs, you can embed any kind of, it, Anvil handles I think 25 different kinds of video archive sites. So from YouTube to TeacherTube to Vimeo, any uh, video site that makes its um, um, its embed tag available, um, um, we we can use or create a you know make it usable inside of Anvil. So um, and I'm not going to talk about copyright and so on here, but you know normally an embedded media file is not considered a violation of copyright. Um, Again, just another sort of combination. I, I guess the other thing I wanted to point out is that, like many um, places, you know, for many years we have made our MA TEFL students do call courses, and it was always hard to know what tool to teach in the call course when it came time to web authoring. Um, you know, our university uses Blackboard, but none of our students presumably would have access to Blackboard, or very few of them would once they left the university. Uh, over half of our students are international, and um, you know, so having something that was low cost and so on was really important. So I guess what I'm trying to highlight here is that this, these pages that I've been showing about Gulf Arabic were both written by a tutor in our program, but who's also an MA student and uh, you know, uses the tool for her own work. And so, um, and you know, normally a teacher can be up and productive with you know just a couple of hours of training in Amp in Anvil. But you can hold me to that by going to the <laughs> one of the links that Vance sent you on the training site and uh, see for yourself. Um, so what I wanted to get to, I guess, is um, sort of, I haven't confused you completely by now. Is that we have an Anvil one that's been up and running for more than five years, and we have an Anvil 2 that, or Anvil beta that's been up and running for about a year. And um, eventually Anvil 1 will go away, um, but not for a while, not for at least a year, and it's going to be replaced by Anvil 2. Um, and I want to you know, just walk through some of these features. Um, um, you know why it's going to be replaced, and probably the number one is not even there, and, and it has to do with money. Uh, it costs a fair amount of money to run a Flash server, and it costs even more to program for a Flash server. Whereas with Anvil 2, we're able to do most of the programming ourselves, and um, the media, you know, serving the media, taking care of the media, whether we're you know, providing it for you, or whether you want to do it yourself, um, is just much more uh, cost-effective and you know humanly doable. So, what's going to right now, if you want to use Anvil One, you have to use the University of Oregon servers, and you know there's issues around that, both from performance um, and maybe privacy, or you know, your college or your university or your school. You know, doesn't or your school district doesn't want you to use anything that's not hosted on local servers. So, with the Anvil 2 version, we will still have a cloud-based one. We'll still serve it because, um, you know, Melanie mentioned she's at a community college. Um, um, many of our people who, many of our community college users, you know, say they use Anvil because they just don't have the tech infrastructure yet. Um, so, you know, having something that's um, cloud-based. Is still part of our plan, but you know we also want to um, share the burden. So much as 
um, the Moodle world has shown. If you you know if you have a learning management system and you, it's open source and you make it available and you let people download it, they'll run it themselves, and and that um, you know part of the uh, you know the burden on the original host is shared, and more importantly, people can customize it and do things with it that they want to do. And then this last one, which may be least familiar to uh, people listening in, is the um, the LTI compatible version, which basically means that you know if your school uses Blackboard, that um, Anvil will be able to run inside of Blackboard. So you still get the speech tool capability of Anvil, but you don't have to you know um, you know your students still log in to um, their system using that tool. And so the key feature, the key fact there is, is the learning management system, the course management system that you use, LTI compatible. And LTI stands for learning tool interoperability, which just basically means that developers um, and educational technologists can write software and without too much extra work, the, the host platform, the Blackboards, the Canvases, the Moodles, and Moodle is by far the best at it, um, will you know, let other tools run inside of them. Um, so we have this working now in Moodle, and we have it working in Blackboard, um, and we're working on Canvas next. But um, um, the LTI compatible version is still about six months out. Um, the for if you're interested in Anvil 2 right now, it's primarily cloud-based. Um, this will be coming as soon as we perfect this, then this will also be coming. Um, and I've been chatting on, so um, maybe this is a good time to stop again, Vance, and take some questions and have some conversation. Hi, it's Melanie again. Um, hi. Um, I'm sorry, I had to step away for just a second. I and hope you didn't already answer this. But if I, I'm using Blackboard with my students, and so I'd be very interested in Anvil too. But um, would it be very confusing for my students if I started with the Anvil one um, almost immediately and then moved them over to Anvil two? Uh, um, okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think it's confusing for students anytime they have to have another username and password. But I, I um, you know, I was talking about the French uh, experience. So those French students at our university do most of their work in Blackboard, but the teacher just has a link to Anvil to, um, or to Anvil, and uh, you know, the students click on it and they you know log in and and. I think that you know, like with most things, if the if what they're getting from it is something that they can't get from Blackboard, if it's compelling, if they find it interesting, um, you know, having yet another username and password, um, they'll they'll get over. Um, the French students, on the other hand, don't have any content management system, and so for them, it's it's the teacher there is using it, you know, in in lieu of Blackboard. So um, it, I guess it depends on what you want to do with it. And um, you know, if there's um, you know, if there's a simpler way, always you know, go for the simpler way. Okay, first. thanks. I'm just wondering, um, really all I want to do is have the students at the very least be able to make recordings that only I can listen to and then respond to. And in the future I would like to um, mimic the old language that a little bit more and then have them Talking to each other and um, even just recording conversations with each other that, that I can also then listen to. So I just I I, I am going to mm -hmm. do this one way or the other, and I would I would like to, <laughs> I would like to do this through Blackboard only okay. because my college and my state system is a, is a public community college is so worried about student you know, identity theft and, and safety and any extra. Passwords and usernames. I've already gotten them over that. They use so many different things with me already. Um, so I guess I just don't know what to do. Whether I should stick with Envil one now or should wait until Envil two comes along. Um, I'm 
I would stick with Anvil 1 and wait for Anvil LTI to come along. And like I said, Blackboard is because it's used at our university too. And 65 percent of the higher ed institutions in the United States, um, you know, we're working hard to to make it available. And you know, frankly, Blackboard did us a disservice when they when they got rid of Wimba. And <laughs> so, uh, I mean, why Blackboard just doesn't make Wimba, you know, or Whatever, for whatever reason they ch chose to eliminate Wimba, um, you yeah, know, it's that it's odd, isn't it? Maybe not necessarily. Institutions pay a lot of money for that. Just maybe none of the schools could do it. Yeah, yeah. That's just and it. I, I have a colleague who's called Blackboard. Blackboard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so boring, and you know, it's, it's all just very quick here, quick there, and uh, it's just it's not pretty. <laughs> Inspiring. Yeah. So with with Anvil too, I think I don't know if it's pretty, but it, it certainly um, you know the pages that we can design and lay out, um, um, and I can go into well, more detail really with that on that. It really does. It looks like it, it just sort of pulls you in, um, and it's, it's, it's alive looking. Whereas Blackboard just is so gray. It just looks like it's in full color. You know, just better. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, Vance brings up a good, a good, a good point. <laughs> Many times, software companies buy other companies not because they want to take their technology and enhance it and improve it and make it part of their platform. They buy them to put them out of business. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, well, let's see. I, I guess I'll start off by saying that, first of all, I, I'm really impressed with Anvil. And the more I see it, the more I really like what it's doing. And I like the uh, the mindset that went into it, you know, the open source and the and the uh, the uh, counter enterprise uh, aspects of it. It's really nice. And I've, having looked at your tutorials, it's obviously quite easy to use. Um, I solved my own problem at the time. I've, I mean, this is you know we, we, we're continually having to reinvent our materials, so I think I'm going to I possibly will try Anvil with a little bit more um, you know a little bit more assiduously. But basically, I solved our problem by recording um, control tower uh, sides of dialogues, <coughs> having the students play those in Audacity, and to record themselves on a sec. Uh, another track. So what you you had was a pilot talking to a control tower. That's, that was my students. They're supposed to be the pilots, and then they uploaded those to Audio Boo. But if, I mean that that's quick and dirty and does the trick. But I was really looking for something that you know would be more in Anvil's uh, league. You know that you could sort of send students to. So, uh, but on that track, um, you. I was wondering how many users you have, both at the University of Oregon and uh, people who've popped in and created lessons like that. And if you create lessons, where do they end up? And, uh, how would you find lessons that others have created and your own lessons? Well, you create a course, of course. But if you wanted to see other people's courses, then how um, would you do that? So th that part of community building, we haven't done a very good job of. Um, so right now, the only way you can see someone else's lessons or courses is if they make you a member. So um, for example, our good friends Deborah Healy and Elizabeth Hanson-Smith are using Anvil 2 right now to teach um, an online course to, um, um, to students in South America. And about trace effects, the the video game they worked on, and you know they are sort of co-developing the course. Um, they're members of each other's course, and they can share lessons back and forth that way. But the system itself doesn't solve the doesn't help. You know, you under I mean you wouldn't know about that at all unless I told you. Um, and they've made me a member, so I can throw in my two cents worth too. Um, so the courses um, for both Anvil 1 and Anvil 2, all content resides on servers at the U of O. Um, the content or the structure of Anvil resides on one set of servers and the media resides on another. 
Um, so if you were to upload the pilot portion as an audio input, um, you know, it would um, sit on our content server and your students, if they were to record, you know, voice, either using voice boards or TCAST or whatever tool, that, speech tool they're going to use, um, they would reside on our, our, our Flash Media servers. So that's, you know, one of the reasons for, you know, um, well, three reasons for moving towards LTI. One, it's, the, or most importantly, it's the ways of the future. Um, the more people get on board with it, the, the better off we'll all be. Two is what Melanie was talking about, the privacy requirements. And um, that way, you know, her students in Connecticut, you know, who already have these Blackboard accounts would be able, you know, the content would, their, their media files would still exist on a server at the University of Oregon, but all of the course management aspect of it would, would not. Um, and I guess the fourth is because it's, in the long run, it's cheaper for us to do it that way. So, and um, as you know well, Vance, and years of doing open source projects, um, once the grant runs out, it's always a scramble to uh, figure out how to keep it alive and running. And what are the prospects That's of long Anvil <laughs> as far as its long-term keeping running, putting something up now, will you have access to it next year, or what sort of term are we talking about? So as long as I can convince the University of Oregon that, you know, so we do everything to work here first, so, you know, make the local do it, I mean, <laughs> you know, provide for our home audience um, and also use the home audience to help us make it the best tool possible. And then, you know, after that, um, you know, really it's just storage space. Um, and, you know, time and, and so on. But, um, you know, once upon a time, our university would spend $40,000 a year to keep a proprietary system running. Well, Anvil runs on far, far less than that. Um, even with labor. So um, if I can keep Norman Kerr, the, the, the programmer, uh, fully engaged on making it the best tool possible for University of Oregon students, then we can take that work and, and turn it over to, to others. I mean, my hope is that, you know, that, you know, like great projects like Moodle, that, you know, Anvil might be the, you know, one of the go-to language lab solutions and, and that others you know, we'll get interested in, in improving it and making it better. Because right now it's, you know, um, a small number of people. I mean, well, a large number of people use, using it, a small number of people um, hey, working on it. <laughs> and not shut it down. <laughs> and not shut it down. <laughs> you can charge the nice thing about Blackboard putting you out of business is you're laughing all the way to the bank, you know. Yes. <laughs> And we're not. <laughs> um, no, that's not our intention. Um, um, when I joined the call interest section, I don't know, 1987, um, I learned very quickly from people like Vance that, you know, software written by teachers for teachers is the way to go. And uh, I have never lost sight of that. But just now the process of writing software has gotten extraordinarily complex. That, all I do is mostly suggest and, and stand back in amazement. Um, but um, yeah, you've got a great partnership going. Oh, I'd like to encourage other people to ask questions. We're up at the top of the hour, and uh, uh, probably won't keep Jeff for too long. It's uh, morning in Oregon there, evening where I am, so two good reasons to not let this go on for too long. But if anybody would like to ask any questions, we got Michael, Mike Marzio here from uh, uh, Real English. He's, he's going to be talking on Learning Together on the 16th of November. So more about that later. If anybody has any, and Robert's got his hand up. Go ahead, Robert. How do I get a mic? Up there. Okay. Yeah, you, you just, oh, can you hear me now? It? Yeah, we can, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah, I just a uh, simple question. As uh, Jeff said, I'm 
used Anvil uh, uh, a fair amount, uh, not real recently because I'm here in the Philippines and don't have uh, actually the, the need or or, uh, or technology at the university where I've been teaching. Um, but uh, I'm just curious if I want to play with Anvil 2, do I have to re-register a new account or something? Or the fact that I already I'm in as Anvil 1, same thing or what? Oh, you would ask a difficult question, wouldn't you? <laughs> because um, right you. now we don't have a oh, <laughs> sorry, Rob. Hear me now? And I can write in yeah. the text chat too if you like, but I'll I'll say it first. So yes, you do have to make a new account, and the screen you're seeing on on in front of you is how you do that. You can use the same email address, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, it's di it's different enough that there probably won't be a smooth migration path from from Anvil one to Anvil two. Well, since I don't have students to use with it right now, anyway, I would just be playing on my own, so I think it's pretty safe. Good. Thank you. Um, you know, as you sure, I mean, as you more than most most people know that, you know, it's dropping a a speech applet or a speech module into a lesson is the easy part. <laughs> Coming up with the the what what that lesson is going to consist of, and you know what, what the outcome is that you're looking for, and how you're going to give feedback. Uh, no one's asked me the really hard question: is how do you give feedback to 25 or 50 or 100 students? And uh, um, I'm not going to answer it unless someone asks. Uh, but or maybe more importantly, I'll I'll turn to someone like Robert uh, and let him help me answer that question. Uh, uh, the only thing uh, yeah, go ahead, Nelly. Oh. Maybe let's go ahead, Robert. Uh, the only thing I figured out in Anvil One was there's some kind of a quiz tool or something like that. Uh, Correct. I only used it once or twice, I think, and uh, in the quiz uh, you can. You can make it audio. It can be an audio response, and that's private, and so it can go back and forth. I believe. Um, I'm not sure, but, but uh, I, it's it's definitely something that uh, if I ever uh, have students where I can use it again, uh, that would be something I would want to do: is, is to give individualized feedback, uh, you know, maybe to 10 or 15 students. Yeah, go ahead, Tommy. Um, that's exactly what I want to be able to do, is have students record and we give them individual private feedback. Is the quiz the way to do it? Is that the only way to do it? Or there, I thought I saw something else in there that we're... Um, so that we, I deliberately leave the quiz out these days because it's... Um, um, well, it works. It's there, but I, uh, I think what I'm showing here is a, a more um, dynamic and meaningful way to do it. So, um, no matter what the input task is, um, or you know, what, no matter what you ask them to record, or you know, what the stimulus is, um, using the response tool um, um, works much better. So this is the private a way of getting a private response. Um, I unfortunately didn't include a slide that shows, well, actually, I think I that overview slide, which is hard to see. Um, um, yeah, that's I, I can't even read it, so <laughs> I'm not going to try. But this one down here at the bottom, if, if you want to see what the authoring interface for Anvil looks like, um, uh, basically you have Different kind, you know, different kinds of functionality, and that's what we're seeing here. And um, 
the response tool that we just looked at uh, I think is the best assessment tool. I, I, having said that, most teachers um, do what this particular teacher does. So um, she's talking to her, so she always prefaces things with to, like to Tron from Fernanda. Uh, um, so the teacher here is actually this woman, Trish, and she did give me permission, by the way, to show this slide. So she just prefaces, you know, who she's talking to. And, you know, she was, this is, you know, college students, they're adults. Um, she doesn't have any problem giving her feedback um, to students directly in the public space that is a voice board. And, you know, her rationale is, I've talked to my students, most of them don't listen to others, but those that do say that they always learn something. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, that's probably not adequate for, for you know, certainly not adequate probably for kids or, um, you know, where there's, where privacy really does matter. But for, um, you know, early on, she was an early user of Anvil. This was all we offered. You know, if you wanted to give direct feedback to somebody, and often her feedback, I notice, is, you know, simply, well, this lesson's about stress and rhythm, so, you know, she picks, you know, two exemplars from whatever the student said and said, you know, this was good and this, this could work, use work. And, and you can see she's got quite a few students and she's giving quite a few, quite a bit of feedback. Um, um, so whether you want the traditional testing environment, if you want the traditional testing environment, I would use the response tool in Anvil. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, homework or a more formal quiz or test. Um, if you have the right group of students and and this makes sense, then you know, do it, and hopefully everybody will learn from it. Um, let me know if that didn't answer your question. Okay. okay well, any last questions? Uh, I would like to welcome Holly, who. Uh, possibly got the time wrong. We're, in, we're the, a bit over an hour right now, an hour and 15 minutes. So and I don't want to keep, um, and let's see, and, and Mike is uh, coming on to say uh, he'd like to explore this. If you want to talk to us, Mike, you're certainly welcome to. Um, anyway, but uh, we'll leave mm -hmm. it open for any more questions and then uh, probably try to sign off soon. So we'll let Jeff get on with his day. And getting on with my day means always starting with the list of questions that come in from Anvil teachers about why something's not doing what it should do. <laughs> or how to make it do something that it doesn't do. Oh, I, yeah, I hope this doesn't spoil your day, but you know, some way to export content so you could take it away when it, when it falls. But anyway, <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. So no, that's <laughs> um, You know, just to mention some you know, people that I've worked with. And so the, the folks at Michigan State University with their rich interactive applications um, um, had a nice way. I mean, you know, we're basically we're both using Flash, you know, as a, the back end for all media files. And, and their audio Dropboxes tool had a way of exporting as MP3. And I never learned how they were doing it. And as often happens, the, the developers left and I think the tool is kind of in a state of flux right now. But, um, you know, what makes Flash so good also is what makes exporting it more complex um, because, you know, it truly is a super compressed, you know, streamed file. And um, um, so it's, it's, it's not trivial, um, or at least it wasn't trivial for us. With HTML5, we're right now we're you know people are uploading um, comp you know it's doing the compression on the WAV file, so the quality is actually much better. Um, upload times, we still haven't worked enough on the compression of the file while it's being uploaded, but you know, we're we're working with WAV files, so that's just to give you a sense of the the difference. Okay, well, I 
like to thank Jeff for coming on and spending all this time and talking to us about Anvil. And um, it's a really neat tool. Um, and I'm sure all of us in this chat will probably try it out. Uh, I, I discovered when I created an account that I already had one from some years ago. I, I do that often. I just grab accounts and forget about them. But anyway, I'm not going to forget it this time. That's for sure. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm getting more and more interested the more I find out about it. So uh, especially since I've really got to uh, write materials for for students. I'm using hot potatoes and things like that. But I think Anvil looks like it could be a pretty nice tool. So uh, you know, it's a space to send to people, and they wouldn't mind since we'll just start them out with some kind. Oh, we're we're getting them to create user accounts everywhere anyway. So you know, Dropbox and everywhere else. So it doesn't really matter. But uh, Jeff, any parting words that you'd like to leave us with? Or? Um, I'll throw in a a, a, a plug for uh, EO electronic village EVOs, <laughs> uh, which I know you're doing one, Dan. Uh, I you're doing it. one. Yes, tell us about yes, that. Yes, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, what we're I'm partnering with um, three, four people, only one of whom I actually know. So, in this kind of distributed world, um, and we're doing one on flipped learning, and you know, Anvil will be uh, part of the the flipped learning. So. Um, people not only will you know get a chance to explore the reasons for and the ways to you know best practices in flipped learning, but Anvil will be you know part of the learning of that, and that'll be starting up in January. I think uh, this is unofficial. I might be letting a cat out of the bag, but I think I've been asked to mentor that, which means that I'm going to be involved, uh, you know, sort of on the side. So that would be really neat. In fact, I'm looking forward to that. That's with Helene, is that right? Yeah, exactly. And John, John mm -hmm. Graney is the person I know best. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, I know Helene. You don't? Do you, is Helene is not the person you know? No, no, we've never met. Uh, so she calls herself Lane, by the way. And uh, but she okay. she uh, came to us through one of the courses I did for. Uh, 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 teeth all before they did the uh, principles and practices of online teaching. The course before that, she was in that course, and she just got so wrapped up in the uh, in the uh, communicating with other teachers, and she's become a star. You know, she's really really keen on that, and she's very involved with webheads and uh, as you as you see with EVO. So that's going to be and EVO, by the way, starts. It, it, we're doing moderator training now. Since you're putting in a plug, let's continue with that. And EVO is uh, Electronic Village Online. You can find it at evosessions.pbworks.com. And uh, it says there, if you go to that site, it's kind of geared toward the moderators right now. But it says, come back in January uh, and sign up for a course. And uh, Jeff is doing one of them. I've sort of said I would do something on Minecraft. And um, Anyway, there's lots of sessions, probably a dozen sessions or so. They're free and they're really high quality because uh, the moderators go through a training program, and we've been doing it since 2001, I think. I've been there since 2002. I'm one of the coordinators. Oh, training starts tomorrow. My goodness. I'm looking wow. forward to it. Holly, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I better get on. I just got back from India, as you know. I was at a conference there. So I'm sort of well, not quite jet lagged. It's in my time zone more or less. But uh, anyhow, I, I I did land. I, I took off early in the morning in India, which is like you know dawn here, and then uh, spent some time in Dubai waiting for a bus. And uh, anyway, got here just in time for this, which is the high point of my day, believe me. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Jeff. This is Learning Together, uh, October twelfth, two thousand and fourteen. We're talking with Jeff Magato about uh, Anvil, which is a program that he and a uh, programmer whose name I've, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm really bad on names. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, anyway, he's developed at the University of Oregon, and gosh, it's really been great talking to you. Uh, and I hope we can Michael. have some more chances. Uh, maybe in uh, when the EVO sessions are on, maybe you'll we'll, we'll, we'll get online a little bit more. Over flipped learning. So, 
Any, anything last minute from anybody? Feel free to say goodbye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, Robert. Hope you're well. Like, Mike and friends. Oh, there, Robert. Sorry, that was Robert. Yeah. yeah. Mike and Melanie have said goodbye. Oh, and by the way, I have to mention uh, a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, everyone has to leave the chat room. I have to be the last one. I'm kind of like the waiter. I just put the tables, the chairs on the tables upside down, and sweep up around the uh, the messes and the puddles on the floor. And if you want to take the mic, the microphone mic. <laughs> Click on the talk button. It should be available. I'll click off mine just to make sure. Thanks a lot again, Vance. I hope to be talking to you soon. OK. Uh, to sign out, Melanie has asked, just close the browser. And just hit the big red X or the little red dot if you happen to have a Mac. And um, from Mike Marzio in France. It's always great to hear from you, so click on the talk button if you want to get a last word in. Okay, well, that would have been Holly Dilletish then. Uh, since she knows about EVO, we've identified her. And she's still here, and Mike is still here. Uh, Jeff is still here. And I'm going to leave the microphone on, uh, the recording on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, I, I, excuse me. I guess uh, Jeff is uh, gone, has he? Um, he might have just popped is... out. Yeah, he just popped okay. out. Okay. That's okay. He'll hear it on okay. the recording. But what did you um, want to say? I just wanted to ask him if he's ever used Anvil. Uh, Either one or two with. Um, I just wanted to ask him if he has ever used uh, either one or two uh, Anvil one or two with on in online teaching, which um, seems to be growing extremely uh, rapidly these days. Yeah, I think he mentioned. Yeah, there was uh, Deborah Healy and Elizabeth Hanson Smith are. Running a course for an online class, he mentioned, and uh, that's it, it's a uh, cloud-based, um, and certainly you could use it for online teaching. And I think they are doing it. Looks like they they can use it for just about anything. And basically, you set up a, a little uh, language lab in the sky, and you, your students can respond over the the interface. I can set up, put a set of links here. I'll just I've got them handy, so I'll just put the the links. They're also at uh, tinyurl dot com tinyurl dot com slash learning together that takes you to uh, the page for tonight and this will be archived at learningtogether dot net not today it's a little late I'm going to go to I'm going to have dinner and I'm going to uh, go to bed but um, and we're certainly looking forward to your talk on the 16th of November Mike. I'm looking forward to coming. <laughs> we'll do it this time, for sure. OK, well, maybe we should say good night because the uh, everyone is gone except for us. I have to wait. I have to let everybody out of the room so I can. That, that makes the recording go to the server. So I have to make sure that everyone is out. And when I leave, it gets stuck on the server. And we'll, we'll have access to it. But it's really good that you came. We appreciate your coming and uh, hope to see you again at some of our sessions. Yeah, I'm just trying to. A little voice break up there. Yeah, I'll try to. Okay, I'm going to turn off the recorder. And thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, it was nice to have this wonderful conversation.